Once again, I'd like to welcome you back to the channel. I reckon nothing beats talking about photography and in particular, nightscape photography. I know it's been a difficult time these last weeks for many of you and I certainly feel your pain as well, but at least we can come together and discuss some great photography topics. And so today I want to have a bit of a chat about panoramas. Lots of you have asked me about them and I thought the topic deserved an episode all to itself. Now to be honest, I don't shoot a whole lot of nightscape panoramas. I tend to prefer the fixed tripod, single stacked image perspective. I think that's because of my emphasis on light painting the foregrounds. I really like to take time shooting the foregrounds of my nightscapes and to be honest, and I've said this before, I reckon I place more emphasis on the foregrounds than I do even the Milky Way. Am I crazy? Well, maybe so, but that's just what I seem to enjoy the most with my nightscape photography. Now, before we move on, I have to mention the overwhelming support you've all shown me regarding this workshop online series. I've received hundreds of messages, emails, and comments about the videos, and I'm just so happy that I've been able to help you guys just a little bit with your nightscape photography journey. This type of photography is certainly a marathon rather than a sprint, but I reckon we need to enjoy the ride along the way. That's where I get the most enjoyment. I've met so many wonderful people, some in person and others via uh, YouTube or Facebook or whatever. It doesn't matter to me, I think you're all awesome. So how would we define a panorama? To me, it's quite simple. A photographic panorama is a technique by which we take more than one shot in camera and blend them together in post processing to obtain either a wider or a higher image. This can be a very handy way to fit more real estate into our nightscape images, especially when we don't have access to ultra wide angle lenses. As with most other things related to photography, I like to keep it as simple as possible. And that in itself is sometimes a challenge. You can use pretty much any lens for shooting panoramas, but I think some work better than others. Because of the overlap required for the software to do the actual stitching of these multiple images, it makes sense to use lenses that have a nice, even field of view. Many ultra wide angle lenses have significant amounts of distortion, especially around the edges of the frame. Now, these lenses can be used for panoramas, but you will sometimes run into trouble with this distortion. I've actually found that 20 millimeter to 50 millimeter lenses on a full frame camera are excellent for panorama shooting. Less distortion and vignetting help the software with the sometimes difficult task of joining and blending multiple images together. Now it's important to note that as with every other form of photography, lens quality is the most important feature when shooting panoramas. Now why is that? Well, it's quite obvious really. Sharp images, less distortion, and better control of flare and aberrations always give better results. One of the things I find quite interesting is how many people want to compromise on camera gear when shooting nightscapes. Yeah, I get it, camera gear costs money and it, it's only a hobby, I can't afford the best lenses, etc., etc. Look, all of those reasons are valid, but you have to understand that nightscape photography is the most gear intensive form of photography out there. Nothing will push your camera and lenses to the limit like shooting the Milky Way, nothing. Now, I know some of you are going to say that by shooting panos, I'm actually cropping out some of the outer edges of the frame and therefore I'm effectively using the best inner part of my lens. Now, this is true to some extent, but my point still holds true. If you want the best results, you have to use the most appropriate gear to get the job done. The essence of panoramas is that you're taking a collection of single exposures and blending or stitching them together to get a larger and more expansive final image. To do that, we need to make sure we overlap each image with the previous one so that the software can see where to make those blends and joins invisible. It's quite a clever process and way beyond my simple brain to explain it any better here. 
So if we're taking a whole lot of single images, then it makes sense that we need to apply the same settings and principles regarding composition and lighting that we apply for any other nightscapes. Now I've mentioned this many times in the past, but we always need to apply these important and basic photographic guidelines to get a pleasing image. Look, I do understand that when we're just starting out in Milky Way photography, we're happy to simply get a shot in focus. Uh, composition and lighting are very much a secondary consideration. But you know, as we progress on our nightscape journey, we begin to see areas where we can improve. And, and look, this is normal and needs to be embraced. So how does this relate to panoramas? Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is this. If we take average single shots, then we'll have an average panorama. When we begin to take really nice single exposures, then we'll begin to take spectacular panoramas. It's simple. A pano is made up of single shots and we need to make that basic connection before we progress to where we want to go. So there are two basic questions I get all the time relating to panoramas. Firstly, how much overlap do you use between each shot and do I use a pano head to make sure this overlap is consistent between each exposure? Well, my answer is based on my own experience and of course there'll be variations depending on what gear you have. I try to estimate about a 50% overlap between each exposure. And no, I don't use a pano head. I use a simple ball head on my tripod. So of course not all the shots will have a consistent overlap. Now does that really matter? Well, in my experience, no, it simply doesn't matter at all. I just guess what I reckon is about 50%. How do I do that? Well, I just look at the camera as I turn it and roughly estimate the overlap. Now to help me achieve this, I enable the inbuilt spirit level in my camera and keep each shot lined up the same. It helps to get the tripod as level as possible while setting this up so that when you rotate the camera, it stays level. Is that very scientific? Well, of course not, but it works fine for me. Now, you know, this is a classic example of not letting the science get in the way of my ability to create the shot. You see, my focus is always on how best to create an image rather than simply taking an image. The difference here is our mindset. Now, I've mentioned this before and I'll mention it again, I'm sure. How we think is the most valuable thing relating to creating our photography. Don't simply copy what others do. Experiment and try new things. You'll make some mistakes along the way, no doubt, but you may just stumble on some magic with that approach as well. Photography is an expressive art form and, and shooting panoramas should reflect that art as well. Speaking of art, I pretty much always include light painting with my panos and that's another aspect that I really need to mention here. I've found that to help the software stitch panos, it really helps to light the image. Now, this may sound basic, but when trying to stitch large panoramas with heaps of dark areas, some of the Pano software programs struggle to find the correct areas to overlap. Consequently, we end up with a hideously distorted final stitch. Now, in my experience, when we light each single image, it helps the software work out the stitching points, which dramatically reduces these errors. Now, of course, that invariably leads to the next question I get all the time. How do I go about lighting my panos? Well, it's quite simple really. I light them exactly the same way that I would a single shot from angles using sweeping low level light across the frame. Now, of course, I never light from directly behind the camera. Is this starting to sound familiar to you guys? Well, it should, because it's how I do all my nightscape photography. Nothing changes just because it's a panorama I'm shooting. I use the same technique no matter whether it's a simple two shot pano or a multi-row complex composition. And that's the magic recipe, if you like. Be consistent and the results will come your way. Nightscape photography does require a high level of concentration to detail, but when applied consistently, each time we go out to shoot, it soon becomes second nature as the, the muscle memory kicks in. And of course, 
when that happens, the sky is the limit as far as our creativity is concerned. Now, as mentioned, panoramas can be very simple two or maybe three shot blends, such as these shown here, or they can be a much more elaborate multi-row and even multi-stacked image like some of these. Whichever method you prefer, the result is ultimately achieved by using the steps outlined here. Okay, so enough of my talking here. Let's get out in the field and I'll walk you through some various locations and compositions and maybe what I was actually thinking when shooting these panos. When we come back, I'm going to run you through some post-processing of one of my image sequences. Oh man, what an absolutely fantastic day it is out here under the gorgeous, well, it's autumn here in Australia. Uh, it's a pretty cool day. It's about 12 degrees, but the sun is shining. We have such fantastic weather at this time of year. And I brought you here because I just had to get out of the office at home. Uh, we're allowed to travel a little bit more now. So I wanted to bring you out here and well, I've been here heaps of times before, you, you'll recognize this location. But I shot here oh, last year, probably not about a year ago perhaps, and I shot a panorama down the river down there. Now, as it stands at the moment, the water level is a bit higher, quite a bit higher than what it was when I shot that panorama. So I can't actually walk down there to show you exactly, but it doesn't matter. I can refer you to the video here where I actually went through the settings and everything else. But I just wanted to bring you here. In fact, I want to show you a couple of locations where I've shot panos just to show you the, the way that I approach the scene. So those trees right down the end there was my subject. And I wanted to shoot them with the Milky Way core, which was coming up over there in the eastern sky. It's a nice flat horizon, got the water, reflections, uh, it was a still night, just like it is now. Absolutely beautiful, clear skies. So I wanted to shoot that. I, I did a number of shots whilst I was here. Obviously, I shot the railway bridge here, this gorgeous old bridge, which uh, is just one of my favorites. I get drawn back to this location all the time. And that's one of the things about nightscape photography. We tend to uh, get drawn back to the same places. Now, I know I've talked about this a fair bit in the past, but I think it's really good to revisit some of the places we've been to. Now, it's possible we've only shot single shots or we've done star trials or something else. So I guess I'd like to encourage you to look at doing a pano. Now, when we talk about panos, we don't always have to have big, wide, expansive panoramas. We can sometimes only have two or three shots side by side or, or one above the other. I'm going to show you a couple of those. But for this particular shot, uh, I use my Nikon Z6 with my 20mm f1.8 G lens. So basically with panos, as I've mentioned, we shoot pretty much the same settings as for single exposures. So in this case, I decided to put my camera into portrait orientation and I shot seven side by side, just sideways like this. And I overlapped about 50%. Now, a lot of people ask me about how much do we overlap our images. Well, and how do you know how much you've overlapped your images? Look, I just eyeball it. I do it roughly by sight. Now, that of course means some of them are going to be 40% overlapped. Some of them might be 60 or 70% overlapped. It, it really doesn't matter because the software works it out. Uh, I, I don't know how the software works. It just does. So I set my camera at f2.8 aperture, 15 second shutter speed, and ISO 6400, which is exactly the same as I would shoot single exposures here and that one came out really really well. Now I know I talk about this a lot in my videos but it's such an important part of my photography. And what is that? Well, it's just getting out here, even in the daytime, out into the outdoors here, and being inspired by the environment. You know, you can definitely be inspired just by being here, breathing in the fresh air, having a look at the landscape. It inspires me no end because I then formulate in my mind how I'm going to shoot my nightscapes when I come back here. Because when I come back here at nighttime, I can't see the landscape anywhere near as clearly as I can 
like I can here today. And so if you've got the time and the space in your calendar, just come out. You don't have to shoot any photographs. You can just walk around, get a feel for the place, get the ambience of the place because it's just exactly the same at nighttime except you can see the stars. And then you can work out the angles. And besides that, you can just sit down and have a cup of tea and just a bicky and just relax. It'll do your soul a lot of good, let me tell you. Now, for those of you who follow my channel on a regular basis, you'll know that I shot here probably about two or three months ago. And the reason I brought you here is to show you or talk about multi-row panoramas. And that was the purpose of coming here. Now, the night I came here, and you can watch the video, which I'll link, was because there was a slight amount of moonlight and that gave enough light on these buildings, which are quite difficult to light paint otherwise, and I was able to use different focal length lenses. Now, on this front view here, I shot with the Nikon Z6 with the Sigma 35mm f1.4 lens. Stopped it down to f2.8, shot 10 second shutter speeds at ISO 6400. And I took about 20 images in four rows. One, two, three, four. Now, I didn't use all of those images, but I overshot with the intention and this is the thing that I was thinking of before I took the shots, the intention was to crop the image because with panoramas, you pretty much have to always crop the image because you miss out on the corners. Now, I've mentioned that a few times. And um, this is facing towards the south, and I was pretty happy with how that one came out. A lot of people take multi-row, big-scale panoramas using longer focal length lenses. And the reason they do that is because you can uh, get more detail and you can just take more shots and fit more in. It's just more real estate. So that's a bit what I did with a 35mm around there. A lot of people use 50mm lenses for panoramas and I can see why. I've done quite a few myself and I do enjoy the 50mm focal length. In this case, however, I came around to the back of the building. Now, it was still lit by the moon. The moon was starting to get around to the western side. I'm, on the, I'm facing down towards the east here. So for this one, I decided to put my 20 millimeter f1.8 lens on the Z6. And again, I shot 30 images in four rows. So that's roughly about seven. And I overshot on the top corner. So four rows of seven plus two extras. And I used the uh, lens at f2.8, 10 second shutter speed at ISO 6400. The reason I went for 10 seconds is because when I shoot panoramas, I often like to keep the shots as close together as possible. It's the same as the method I use when I'm stacking images. So I like to keep the shutter um, actuation of each shot close together. I think it just helps with the stitching. Once again, I overlapped heavily at 50% at least. Now, a lot of people would say to me, well, you don't need 30 shots to shoot that. It's not that big. Well, you're probably right, but I just went overlapped a lot more. Now, one of the other problems that you will have when you're shooting a structured shape object, such as this, when you're shooting so many images, you will get that parallax error. In other words, this building starts to warp around on the edges. Now, there's really no way around that because it's what we're trying to do is actually put a 3D shaped object into a 2D shaped pano image and well the physics just doesn't work but you know it still looks pretty good now I think you can certainly see with the railway tracks and things like that you'll see curvature but I guess that's part of the intrigue of the whole panorama system to start with and I was pretty happy with that just having that moonlight was able to light the structure of the building without me having to worry about doing light painting and it made the whole shooting process a whole lot easier now it's such an absolutely beautiful day, I'm just going to make the most of it. So what I want to do now is move on to a couple more locations just so I can show you the actual way that I shot and the angles and what it looks like in broad daylight. So let's get moving. Okay, here we are at our next location and it's really quite simple. This old dead tree here right on the side of this country dirt track. Hardly anyone ever drives up and down here. This is a very easy subject to find, very easy subject to shoot. Now, what I did here was uh, quite a simple vertical panorama. I think they call it a vertorama. So four shots in a horizontal landscape orientation. One, two, three, four. Simple as that, just so I could get to the top of the tree. 
And so I shot this with the Z6 with the 20 millimeter f 1.8s lens. Shot it at f 2.2 for 15 second shutter speeds at ISO 6400. And yeah, quite a simple shot really, because uh, again, with the intention of overlapping roughly about 50% to do the pano. So I, all I needed was four shots to get that little bit of light painting, not much, because to be honest, it doesn't need very much. It's a very simple composition, but extra bonus for you guys. What I'm going to do is include the raw files for this tree, so you can do some practicing in your own uh, software and your own system at home. So I'll be interested to see how that goes. So, yep, I was happy with the end result of this one. And uh, while I was here, by the way, I took some portrait orientation, single tripod position stacked shots. So I took 15 images at f2.2, same settings, except 10 second shutter speed. Uh, ISO 6400, 15 stacked shots for the background. Then just a few shots on the foreground just to light the tree a little bit. Now I didn't have to change the focus because I was already back about seven or eight meters away from the tree, maybe even a bit more than that, to get the whole tree in. That one looks awesome. I'm really, really loving that shot, but that's not a panorama, but I just thought I'd sneak that one in while I was here anyway. And so I think it's only just fitting for my final example. We come back here to the farm and I want to show you a panorama shot that I took here in this backyard, this courtyard area here. So I was using the Nikon Z6 as usual with the 20 mm f 1.8S lens. Turn the camera into portrait orientation. I was shooting at f 2.2, 15 second shutter speed, ISO 6400. So just keep that in your mind. What I'm doing with these panorama shots, I'm shooting the same camera settings as I do when I'm shooting single individual frames. So all I'm doing is adding more than one into the panorama. So what I've decided to do here was shoot two rows of 11 shots. So that's a total of 22 images in a, remember, portrait orientation. Because the reason for that was because the Milky Way was getting up quite high in the sky over here, the big nice open space here. And I wanted to make sure I captured as much of it as I possibly could. At the same time, I really liked the way that the, the fall of the land here uh, worked into my frame. So I started off shooting up towards that tree. Now it's quite interesting. In the daytime here, the tree just there, you can really not even pick it out from the trees behind, but at nighttime, with a, just a touch of light painting on it, it looks absolutely fantastic. So then I shot there, uh, down past this shed here that you can see, uh, heading off down this direction towards that water tank, there's another shed here, and then finally down here, which is just out of the frame at the moment, there's a fence which is surrounding the shearing shed there. So I captured some of, of that fence. So all in all, we're probably looking about 120 degrees, maybe 130 degree angle to capture all of this. So I made sure I got lots of the foreground here, and that's one of the things, often people shoot panoramas and they, they forget that they have to um, crop the images. And so if you don't get enough of the foreground, you, you end up chopping into it too much. So I've got a fair bit of this ground, uh, and I wanted to get a lot of the sky, obviously, that's why I put two um, on top of each other. And I think this one came out really well. And this is probably a shot I've never actually taken before. Believe it or not, I've been to this farm, well, hundreds of times, never actually done that shot. Okay, so I hope that helps you get a clearer picture of my mindset whilst I'm out in the field. Now, right now, we're gonna go through the post-production of one of my panoramas. So, let's get into it. Now, I'd like to show you how I put this pano of these dead trees over the lake together. 
And here we have six images down the bottom here. And they were shot at f2.8, 15 second shutter speed, ISO 6400, 20 millimeter focal length. Now you can see the first images on screen here, and these are the adjustments I've done. Not very much. Uh, just plus 10 there, minus 27 highlights, plus 10 in whites. Uh, down to the lens profile corrections. Yes, I've checked both of those. Um, and I've added noise reduction here, plus 31 luminance, plus 31 contrast, plus about 46 color. Now this is taken with the Z6 camera. I tend to always adjust the color uh, noise reduction because it does have a bit of color noise, but they're easily fixed here. Um, and you can see here when I highlight that image and the next one after it, let me just compare those two because what I want to do is, is show you, uh, here we go, compare, the amount of overlap. So you can see here the center of that first image and then the center of the second image uh, there's there's a lot of overlap in these, and that's deliberate. Uh, I mentioned to you before that I like to have a lot of overlap in my panos, so that's obviously apparent here, and it's pretty much the same all the way through. Okay, now let's get back, and what I want to do is highlight all of these. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Now what I'm going to do here, uh, uh, by the way, I've synced the settings, so they're all exactly the same for each shot. And remember, I set the white balance and everything in camera. So any adjustments I do here to one is exactly the same for all the rest. So I'm going to right click on one of these images, go to Photo Merge Panorama. Now what I'm doing here is I'm going to merge in Lightroom. Now currently you can see the, that the projection method here is cylindrical. I don't think that's what I want to use, but I'll see what it comes up with as a preview. Yeah, it's, it's not, it's too distorted. So I'm going to go to Spherical, which is that top one. And we'll just see what that comes up with. That's much better. Now, one of the great things I like about this merge to panorama in Lightroom is this boundary warp slider. So if I just move that across, I'll move it all the way across to 100. And what that does is actually stretches it out and smooths it out nice and straight. And that's perfect. So what I'm going to do here is click Merge down the bottom. And now just wait until that merges to our pano. Okay, well here you can see what it has done. It's done a pretty good job. That's our six images blended uh, just in Lightroom. We haven't done any other work at this point in time. Uh, and I like it. Uh, just I'll just show you a full screen view. And that's just straight out of Lightroom. Now there's a few things I want to adjust here. You can see these aeroplane trails. There's a few little bits and pieces there. So what I'm going to do here is right click, I'm going to take this image to Photoshop because I find Photoshop much easier and more efficient when dealing with small adjustments and I'll also do a little bit of a global adjustment. But anyway, what we're going to do is right click on that image, edit in, edit in Photoshop and we'll just wait for that to open up and we will have a look at it. Okay, so here we are in Photoshop. You can see our single layer here. It doesn't take long to load up when it's just one single layer. So the first thing I'm going to do is clone out these, there's a few aeroplane trails in there which I don't like. And look, I do find that Photoshop is really, really much more suited for things like cloning than Lightroom is. So I'll just go to my clone stamp tool, uh, nice soft brush, 100% opacity. Just click it by holding down Alt and clicking that space there and just basically going over that. I can do the same down here. You see all these little little ones here. I'm doing exactly the same thing for all of them, which, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I'm not going to waste too much of your time here because I'm sure you already know how this, this tool works in, in Photoshop. Um, it's, it's quite efficient, quite handy, and you can see it's working here. Now, I'm zoomed in a, fa whoops, I'm zoomed in a fair way here, which obviously helps to be able to see what I'm doing. So I'll zoom back out again, you can see the full picture. Great, they're gone, as simple as that. Now, while we're here, one thing I will do is add a couple of adjustment layers. So I'm gonna add a curves adjustment layer. And you can see what the curve looks like. It's this little, little histogram. So I'm gonna push up the, the light areas and just decrease the shadow areas just fractionally, not too much. And yep, that looks, that looks pretty good. So uh, you can see the difference that makes, that's with it off and that's with it on. It just punches the, I guess, the uh, contrast of the image a bit, which, which I, I like. 
I like how it sort of brings you, draws your eye into this area in the middle. Now, some of you might look at this and say, oh, it's blowing out this highlight down here, uh, which it sort of is a little bit. So I can, I can sort of play with that a bit. So let me go back to my layer mask, go to the brush tool, make it soft and uh, opacity probably about 20% or thereabouts and just gradually just go over that just a tiniest bit. And you, you don't see a whole lot of adjustment, but I can guarantee it is adjusting. You can see the hole I've punched there into that mask. So now that bit there isn't really being affected as much as it was before, but the rest of the image still is, and, and I like what that's done. Now, one other thing that I often do with Photoshop whilst I'm here is add a levels adjustment layer. So that's right here. So I'm just gonna click on that. Now that's a similar type of tool to the curves adjustment layer, and it, it does also work on contrast. So let's just have a look and see what that one's done. So levels, not much, just, just enough to be effective enough to give this image a bit more punch. Look, I love the colors, I love everything about this image, and like I said, I don't actually mind having that little bit of light pollution sort of silhouetting. I love the silhouette through the water and the reflection in the water. So that's really nice. Um, so I, look, to be honest with you, that's all I really wanna do with this image. So I'm gonna flatten the whole thing up, flatten image, because otherwise I've got a quite a large file size and I don't want a heap of large file sizes on my computer. I'm just gonna cross out of Photoshop here, press yes to save that. And this will take me back to Lightroom and you'll see very soon how it looks and there it is. Now th that's pretty awesome. This is the original image that came out of Lightroom that I just sent off to Photoshop. And this is the one here with the adjustments made. I think it just looks a little bit punchier. So when I go full screen on that one, there's our pano, six shots, uh, quite simple to shoot in the field and actually quite simple to edit on the computer. Okay, so while we're editing here, I'll just have a look at one more. Now, this is a multi-row image, and it's the courtyard at the farm that I showed you just previously. So you'll notice there's 22 images down the bottom here. I've already done the basic edits on each one, and you can see that here. The settings here were 15 seconds each at f2.2, 20 millimeter focal length, ISO 6400. So I'm not changing a whole lot with most of my images. Uh, you can see the settings, a little bit of contrast adjustment, but not too much. The other thing I always adjust is, oh, I've added noise reduction here, plus 31 luminance, plus 32 contrast, and plus 52 color, and remove chromatic aberration. So to process this image, what I'm going to do is highlight all of the shots. So there's 22 of them down the bottom. Now this time, um, I'm going to, well, I'll, look, I'll do the same thing. I'm going to go to photo merge, merge to panorama, and it is, this will take longer because it's, there's more images there, but you'll see it's, it's creating, firstly, a preview here. And I'll just have a quick look at this preview to see what it looks like uh, and when that comes up, and then I will decide whether I want to continue with it. Okay, so it's come up here with our preview, and that looks pretty good. Now, one thing that you'll notice here that's at, that the bottom here is a little bit under shot, that's because it was up higher on the hill even though I did think of it when I was shooting. But if I adjust this boundary warp, like I did with the other image, all the way across, you'll notice it fills that out. But the problem is, suddenly we've got our horizon is not straight. Everything becomes curved, and I don't like that. So I'm not gonna go with that. So what I'm going to do is, well, I could maybe try a little bit, just to help it a fraction, but it starts to push it up the hill. So now I think I'll just take it back to where it was. I am going to merge this and that's gonna take a little while, so we'll come back when that's done, and then I'll show you what I'm gonna do after that. Okay, so here we go, you can see what's happened here. We've got uh, our stitch of all of our images, which I like the look of. Now, I'm gonna to have to crop this, obviously, um, and I'll, I'll just have a look at cropping that right now, actually. So I'm gonna bring it in a fair way on the sides, because essentially, I don't need every single bit. I, I like this tree, uh, and I, oh, well, I, you know, how much of that do I need? I don't need all of it. So uh, now you can see down the bottom, it's not quite filled in, but I'm just gonna leave that for the time being. Now I'll go down a fraction at the top there. So I'm in Lightroom still. I love the cropping tool in Lightroom, it's really easy. 
Okay, so there's our panel. That actually looks really, really good. The only thing I have to sort out is just these little bits on the bottom here. So I'm, what I'm going to do, and just remember, by the way, the land does slope down here. So that's a natural fall. That's exactly what it does look like. Um, so it looks great. Now, what I'm going to do here is take this image over to Photoshop and show you what it will look like. So to do that, I right click on the image, edit in Photoshop. So let's go. Once again, this is going to take a little while. But now that took uh, uh, probably about 10 minutes to render that out in Lightroom before. Uh, but once it's rendered out, it opens up in Photoshop pretty quickly and it won't take very much longer. Okay, so here we are, we're in Photoshop and you can see down the bottom there. Now there's a few ways we can go about fixing this up. And the first thing I'm gonna have a look at um, is the clone stamp tool that I showed you just before. So I'm gonna zoom in on that image down the bottom. Uh, not quite that much, just so I can see it, that's it. Now I'll go to my clone stamp tool, which is here. Um, bump up the size a little bit, soft brush. And I want it on 100%, yep, that's good. And with the clone stamping, you have to be a little bit careful because it starts to look too repetitive. But what I'm gonna do is just sample an area. Uh, oh, we'll start here, hold down Alt, sample that area, and just paint it along. And you can see what it does, it, it actually copies the area that's around. And it, it does a good job. In, in most cases, you wouldn't even know that that was duplicating. So what I'm going to do here, though, is what I found is sometimes with this tool, it, it gets too repetitive. So you, you tend to move the space that you're cloning from, from to another area, if that makes sense. So it's not directly below the area you've just worked on. Uh, it, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say, I'm trying to make it a little bit irregular. And you can see there, that looks OK. It's, it's not directly copied from here. I've got it a little bit from over here etc. Uh, so let's just move across and you can see we've got the same thing to do here. So I'm just going to grab my clone stamp tool about here and just paint that into there. Now you can see how it's copied that exactly. Now I don't like that. So what I'm going to do here is, is grab a little bit there and just rub that down there. And, th and what that does, it tends to break up the pattern, the repetitive pattern. So it looks more um, realistic. Now, of course, we still want to follow the contour of the land here, which, which is similar all the way down here. So I'm not trying to be too radical with it. It's just that I know that that can sometimes get a little bit like that. And remember, we're also zoomed in on this particular area. Um, so, you know, because of that, we can be probably a little bit conservative about the whole thing. Now, this is a much darker area here which I think is consistent with the rest of the ground there. So I'm not going to be too worried about any, any of that. Uh, this bit here, let's just go there, something like that. Look, you can play around with your clone stamping tools. It's not something that, that I'm going to spend too much time with here because that's not the point of this video. Um, some of you will be talking to, to me about uh, using the Content Aware fill for this. There's a tool in Photoshop called Content Aware. Uh, I, I, I've tried before with these panos and it, it is quite, um, what's the word, um, inconsistent is the way I would put it. So I think I prefer to do this. And to be honest, look, th this isn't very difficult. And, and this part down the bottom here that we're looking at, um, when we zoom back out again to see the full, full image, you can hardly even notice those areas that I've done. Remember, I haven't done up here. I've only done right down the bottom there. So there we have our, our basic image, and it, it's looking really, really good. Oh, there's one other thing I want to get rid of. There's an aeroplane trail in there somewhere. There it is. Now, you already know I hate aeroplane trails, so I'm going to clone that out the same as I did before in the other uh, video. So let's just have a quick look at it. Hold down Alt, click, and just find the area you're working on and clone it out. Gone. It's pretty clever, isn't it? All right. Now let's go out and have a look at the whole image. This, this is looking fantastic. What I am going to do here is a couple of things. Firstly, I'm going to add a curves adjustment layer and I've done this a fair bit before, as you already know. So let's just click on that. Curves and bump up this, this curve. 
there, drop it down a fraction there. And what I'm what I'm effectively doing here is I'm, I'm adding contrast to the image. You can see immediately there that the, the sky looks completely different to what it, it looks very washed out there and sort of uh, uninteresting. But now it's suddenly got a lot more interest. But what I don't like is what that has done to the landscape down the bottom here. So easily fixed because I've got an adjustment layer here. I can actually rub out portions of that adjustment. So I'm going to get my brush tool back out again. Yeah, leave it on 100 and a soft brush and a fairly large one. Remember, this is a panorama, so it's a, it's a very large megapixel image. Whoops, that's the clone stamp tool. That's not going to work for me. Um, so let's just go to the brush tool. I do that all the time. I bet you guys do too. Just going to rub out that curve on the ground section. Not on the sky, because I want it on the sky. Oh, let's just make sure I've got my opacity at 100. Sorry, that was on 22. <laughs> you can see that the things you can get uh, into um, into a bit of trouble when you don't change the adjustments that you've had previously. All right, so now you can see when I do that, it's really only adjusting the sky because I just simply brushed out the ground. It's as simple as that. This doesn't have to be complicated, guys. It's, it's a fairly simple process. And if you know me, you know I don't go for the complex methods of, of doing editing. Let's put a levels adjustment in here as well. And a levels adjustment, as I mentioned before, is a similar contrast adjustment to the curves adjustment. But it just gives you a little bit more control over certain areas. So uh, that's, that's pretty good. Just to fine tune that a little bit. Okay, um, once again, I don't want that uh, to affect the ground, but the easiest way to do this is to simply copy that layer mask down from there to there. So I'm just gonna hold down Alt, drag it down to there, and it asked me if I wanna replace that layer mask, and I say yes. And I didn't have to rub it out again. It's just a, a simple way of doing these things. Okay, now, what I'm going to do here is just copy that layer for a minute. So layer, duplicate layer. Yes, and uh, I'm going to hide that bottom one. And what I'm going to do is actually merge these together. So that if you go up under layer down to merge visible, that's merging all the visible layers here. So it didn't merge that one because it wasn't visible. I had the, the little eyeball unchecked. Now, the reason I've kept that is because I want to compare these in a minute because I'm going to do some star minimization here on this just to show you what you can do with these images. So I'm going to go up to select. Uh, color range, where it says sample colors, I'm going to go to highlights, and I'm going to adjust the fuzziness here and the range to give me, uh, you know, a, a bit of a, a selecting all these stars up here in the sky. You can adjust that to your leisure. Uh, click OK on that, and then I'll go to select again, modify, expand. Now I've done this plenty of times before. You would have seen expand by two pixels. You can see it's, it's done a lot more selection now and select, modify, feather, and that's going to be one pixel. Then we go to filter and we go right down to other down the bottom and go to minimum. So we're adding a minimum, what's known as a minimum filter. And I'm going to do this at 0 0.3. So that's not a lot, not a lot of adjustment. Click OK. And now you can see it's thinking about the adjustment. And there it goes. It's doing its work. And because this is a larger size image, being a pano, it takes a bit longer. I'm going to deselect that now. And you can see it's done some star minimization. So if I if I toggle between these two, that's what it looked like before, and that's what it looks like now. That also has the, the layers on it. Now, one thing I've noticed here, once I've done that, let me just zoom in. I've found some stitching errors here. Now, a lot of you will say, yes, you get that when you stitch in Lightroom. Um, and I could have stitched this in Photoshop directly, uh, straight from Lightroom. See, there's a few there. See these stitching areas? Let me just make that a bit smaller. See these here? They're stitching errors in the software. And to be honest, Lightroom is not the best piece of software for stitching. So, um, but what I'm going to do is clone them out. So I'll do my best anyway to clone them so that we don't have too much of a new issue here. So same thing as I did before. Just rub over that. Now, some of you will think, oh, this, is, this isn't very nice. I don't like what you're doing there, but it's a, it's a way of getting rid of these stitching 
errors. Um, there was a major one over here somewhere. Here we go. If I had more time, I'd go through this and show you in just doing it all in Photoshop, but I don't think it really matters. You, you get the gist of what I'm talking about. And, and this does work. Cloning them out like this, it actually does the job. Remember, we're not looking too hard at each individual pixel here. We're just looking at the overall thing by the time we get to the end of the image. Um, there's another one. So I'm just cloning them. So I've zoomed in reasonably tight. And you can see how we're looking there. I think I did that one, but we'll do a bit more again. Okay. Um, a lot of those ones up in the Milky Way area you won't even notice because there's a lot of uh, variation there in the stars. Okay, overall, that looks pretty good. Let's just zoom back out again. And now you don't notice it so much at all. All right. That doesn't look too bad, does it? So I think what I will do now is, while I'm here, I'll do one more curves adjustment. So let's go for the curves here again. Don't have to do any of this. I'm just showing you what you can do once you're in this particular space in Photoshop. Photoshop is a very powerful tool, as you can see, uh, for making adjustments to your images. So that's a curves adjustment. Once again, I'm going to not, I don't want that on the ground part of it, so I'm going to uh, rub it out with my brush tool, my adjustment layer. So it's rubbing it out, just manually, rubbing it out. Not everything has to be complicated. There we go. How's that looking? It's pretty good, isn't it? So the curves, that's without, that's with. Now it might be a little bit heavy through this section here. So what I'm going to do there, drop my opacity on my brush and just, just go over that and double it out a little bit. Because what that does is effectively um, decreases the amount of contrast that I'll put in there with that curve. So, yeah, much better. Uh, I'm, again, I'm rushing through, so I apologize for this, but I don't want you here all day. So I'm going to layer, flatten image, OK. There we have our final edited image. I'm going to go cross out of Photoshop, go into back into Lightroom. So it's going to save this image, all the edits I've done from Photoshop, and put them into Lightroom. So you can see here, I'll show you that comparison. This image is the original stitch we did in Lightroom. Interestingly enough, when you zoom in on some of these areas, you can see where those stitching errors are. Uh, but because I did those adjustments in Photoshop, it actually highlighted them a lot more than it did from here. So there's our original, and here is our edited image. And uh, I'll just click that on full screen so you can have a look at it. Doesn't look too bad, does it? That's 22 images edited firstly in Lightroom and with some additional editing in Photoshop. I hope you found that helpful. Now, of course, there are many tools you can use to stitch panoramas. I've used Lightroom, Photoshop, PT GUI, Microsoft Ice and others, and they each give great results. It really depends on what you have at your disposal. Anyway, that's about all, all I've got for you this week. Look, I've included some raw files for you guys to download and edit at the link underneath this video. And I'll be really keen to see how you go with those. You can see all the reference videos regarding panoramas, as well as my download and PayPal links on my website listed below. As always, look, I'm keen for you to leave some comments down below and ask questions if you're not certain about any aspect of this video or even my previous episodes here on the channel. This is the final video in this online workshop series. It's been an absolute pleasure spending the time with you these last eight weeks. Yeah, eight weeks. Wow, that's gone by rather quickly, hasn't it? Look, I realize there may be other topics I haven't covered, such as uh, star trackers, but look, maybe I'll address some of those down the track. Right now, I'll be going back to my regular adventure and on location videos, which I actually love doing. So thank you so much for your ongoing support and encouragement. It's been so appreciated. 
I want you all to keep in touch and of course until we meet up again and look I've already got some interesting content bubbling away in the Nightscape oven so stay tuned. Have an awesome week and I'll see you guys later.